So my name is Whitney Donhauser, and I'm the Rone Mental Director here. Um, and we're so excited to present the first event in our new series of programs, New York's Future in a Changing Climate, which explores the challenges and opportunities presented in the, muse in the museum's future series. Like I just got, oh, okay, I'm back. Um, and the Future City Lab is our third interactive gallery of our permanent exhibition, New York at its core, which is 400 years of New York City's history. So the first two galleries, for those who have not seen this permanent exhibition, the first two galleries of New York at its core capture through 450 objects and computer interactives, the human energy that drove New York to become the city that it is today. The third gallery, the Future City Lab, turns its attention to explore five challenges and opportunities that New York will face in coming generations. So the first four of those challenges ask our visitors to look at the future of our economy, housing, transportation, and how to coexist with other citizens. The fifth challenge of the lab, however, living with nature, ask how citizens of this enormous, complex city of ours with our huge appetites are going to maintain a balance with nature and our surroundings, natural ecosystem, and uh, how we're gonna depend on so much from food, water, health, protection from extreme weather, green space, recreation, and beauty. So this has always been a very, very delicate balance to achieve and only grows more and more critical as our climate grows warmer. So I would love to thank our series sponsor, Saville Studley, and particularly our trustee, Mitch Steers, who has provided so much support for the, today's program and for the entire events related to this series. And this afternoon, we are thrilled to have eight amazing speakers join us for two wide-ranging conversations examining how New York City can survive and embrace its future in the changing climate and rising waters. After the conversations that we have, we'll invite everyone upstairs to a reception. This is at the end, after the two series, for wine and light refreshments in our rotunda, where the director of the Future City Lab, Kubi Ackerman, will introduce the, the lab and the museum scholars. We'll have them stationed throughout the whole lab to answer any questions that you might have. So it's also a great honor for me to acknowledge the series partners, and we've partnered with numerous organizations, um, including the nonprofit communications group Climate Nexus, the Tishman Environment and Design Center, and Urban Systems Lab, which are both at the New School. And we're grateful for this opportunity to work with them and really benefit from their input into this series. So please check your printed programs for a complete list of all of our affiliates, and we thank all these organizations organizations for their support. So I'd also like to encourage any of you who are not museum members to join us today, um, which uh, membership here helps us support our exhibitions, our public programming, and our educational outreach to the schools. So if you join today, we will give you a membership for 15 months rather than a normal 12 months. And there's so much fun activities that we do here. Um, and as a member, you get free admission, reduced rates on programs, discount in our sales shop, in our cafe, and any of the sales associates in our, uh, in our shop can help you with a membership. So this is the moment where I ask you to turn off anything that buzzes or beeps, except for, for those of you who like to tweet, um, we do. We encourage that using the hashtag MCNYLive. And now, please join me in welcoming the director of the Future City Lab, Kubi Ackerman. So, thank you. Thank you, Whitney, and welcome again to the museum. Uh, it's very exciting to be here on this, uh, for this inaugural event in this series. Um, as Whitney mentioned, we're going to have two conversations today, separated by a 15-minute intermission, during which time we'll have coffee and tea in the back of the room here. Um, I'd also like you to, uh, to encourage you to check out our museum shops on the first floor. We have some books available by some of our distinguished panelists today for sale. Uh, so this series is inspired by the Future City Lab, which is the third gallery in our uh, New York at its core exhibition, which, as Whitney mentioned, covers 
uh, the big challenges that the city's facing in the coming generations. And it could be argued that uh, none of these challenges is as big and as daunting as that of climate change, which threatens, uh, it poses, poses an existential threat not only to New York, but uh, to our society as we know it. <clears throat> And for that reason, we felt an obligation not only to cover it in the, in, and address it in the gallery, but to organize our entire first series around this issue. And um, in so doing, we were prompted to ask ourselves, what is the role of a museum, and what is the role specifically of a, a history museum in addressing urgent contemporary concerns? And uh, uh, because we're not the only institution in this city, obviously, to address these issues. And part of the role of the History Museum is to uh, tie the events of the past to those of the present, uh, to forge narratives that help us understand the present and where we're going in the context of what came before. And by that measure, it could be argued uh, that uh, climate change poses an unusual challenge for while we've always had to uh, grapple with our relationship to our natural environment, um, uh, in many ways, climate change resists historical narrative uh, in that our ability to so radically alter our environment on a global scale so as to threaten its very ability to support civilization is in many ways without historical precedent. Uh, and that's part of what makes it so difficult to, to face. But I would argue that th that's not the full picture because as many of our panelists uh, today have, have written about in their work, uh, in many ways we're seeing familiar historical and behavioral patterns at play in our response or lack thereof to the crisis. And in order to effectively respond, we may need to recall historical and perhaps even pre-modern ways of understanding and, in, uh, and inhabiting our world. Uh, for as our panelist uh, Amitav Ghosh writes in his, in his book, The Great Derangement, an awareness of the precariousness of human existence is to be found in every culture. Uh, and he goes on to write that uh, it was in the literary imagination, most of all, that was everywhere informed by that awareness. And that brings me to my second point as to why we're hosting the symposium, which is that as a cultural institution, Part of our role can be to uh, provide a voice and to offer perspectives that are not always at the forefront of climate discussions, which often tend to be oriented towards more technocratic solutions. Uh, and for while our continually evolving state of the science and potential policy remedies are central to our ability to be able to react to the crisis, it's become painfully clear that the increasingly dire warnings of climate scientists are not having uh, the impact we would hope or expect, and that there are much larger political, cultural, social, and behavioral forces at play uh, which transcend, in many ways, rational consideration. Um, <clears throat> and that's why we feel that the role of cultural institutions is so important in addressing this crisis. And finally, I'd like to say that in our role as the Museum of the City of New York, uh, our aim in the series is to focus on a specific place, which is our city. Uh, because as much as this is a global problem, its effects and its impacts are distributed uh, very unevenly, both locally and globally. And effective response must ultimately be grounded in local place-based knowledge. Uh, and incorporate the needs of specific communities. And that's why we have a focus, especially in the second panel, on what New York's communities uh, can and are doing to address this crisis. So with that, I'd like to welcome you again, and I would like to welcome our first panel. Uh, I'm Andy Revkin. Oh, there we go. I, um, I've been writing about this weird issue now since 1985. How long is that? I, it's long enough. Um, but I, I just rejoined the fray. I, I was in academia for six years after 20 years at the Times. Um, I was at Pace University for a while, writing my blog at the Times, and then I, but now I'm back at ProPublica, uh, back in doing full-time climate journalism again, finishing a pretty complicated story right now that's Got my wife even more agitated than me because of the vibes I put out. Um, <laughs> everyone on this panel is a special, has a special um, appropriateness for today's conversation, the one we're doing, which is about this idea of confronting the unthinkable, because that implicitly involves um, not just the physical environment, but our reactions to it, or our lack of reactions to it. Um, I'll introduce them in a second. But I want to introduce the basic concepts, I think, that we'll be talking about. One, the word confront is an interesting word. To me, it implies uh, resistance. Resist. Confront means to resist. Uh, so I would add, I, I think one of the first things we'll talk about probably is um, how much of this needs to be confronted? Where do you draw the line between confrontation and, and embracing change? Uh, you, whether you call it embracing, accepting, 
there are aspects of this problem that are underway that can't be stopped. Um, New York City will be a city with rising waters for centuries to come. Um, and I wrote critically when Mayor Bloomberg uh, last spoke about this as mayor in 2013, his speech to me felt like climate denial because he basically said, um, uh, we will not retreat. <laughs> and any scientist who understands the basics of how climate change happens knows you can't just do that, unless we go into the realm of geoengineering, which uh, there's a big movie out now about. So this, uh, there's a lot of denial around in different ways. Um, uh, there's a lot of different senses of, um, again, where do you draw the line? To me, uh, I wrote a reflection on this several years ago for a couple of magazines where it, it, felt, it feels a little bit like mortality. You know, we're all going to die. It's, it, even saying those words is kind of uh, a bummer. But um, how do you deal with that? Where do you, where do you confront, what do you confront in terms of, uh, you know, shaping your life in a better way? And what do you accept? And, and when do you accept it? And so so it's, there's aspects of this problem that have that scale to them. Uh, but we'll get into that in a, in a big way going forward. It's great to see a museum involved. Um, one of the things that thrilled me a few years, years ago was when the Wildlife Conservation Society did the um, Manahatta exhibit. Some of you probably saw that, or the book. That took us back in time 500 years ago to when Manhattan, where we're all sitting, was a, an ecological system that had no relationship to what we look at now. And the, the challenge of this conference, this meeting today, is going forward in time. Uh, you know, what do you do? What, again, what can you do based on what we understand about the history of cities and how they change or don't change to make uh, New York City that, that can thrive in, in a world with no new normal coastline and that kind of thing. And, and that exhibit, I thought, was a great way to sort of frame, to, to remind us that change is normal. Uh, change right now is, in, in all of our systems, is kind of seems unthinkable. <laughs> so let's, let's start right in. I just want to introduce, if, I don't really have to introduce anyone here, hopefully. Uh, um, I'll start at the far end. Elke Weber, who was at Columbia University for a long time. She created the, I love the name of uh, CRED. <laughs> this was the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions. And she's just recently, just a year or so, moved to Princeton. And uh, she, her background's in psychology and in uh, studying social systems. And she's been an invaluable source of mine for a long time on the, the sort of soft, softer side of this side of how we confront these issues. And in the middle is Amitav Ghosh, Ghosh who, um, Calcutta born, has been everywhere in the world as far as I can tell, and written uh, creatively in both fiction and nonfiction about everything uh, you can imagine. Uh, and won wonderful awards, uh, his most recent book, which I think has this fantastic, it's a nonfiction book about the lack of fiction around this issue and, and that, you know, imagination around the issue of climate change. And I'll ask him about what was the key question, are, are, are we deranged? <laughs> you know, I guess that's the great, the great derangement was uh, the, the main title of his new book. Naomi Oreskes, who I've known for a long time, is right here. She's a historian of, scientists, of science and a geologist by background. Uh, she's written forcefully on the attempts to uh, exploit human behavioral trends, <laughs> uh, tendencies, uh, the book Merchants of Doubt, she was co-author of, uh, which is a must read on how um, manipulable we can be and that people have spent lots of resources making sure that um, our tendency toward inertia is sustained. Um, and uh, she, uh, there was a film also called Merchants of Doubt. It was based on, based on the book, right? And, and she is, uh, oh, I guess it had to be. Only front line. Though. Yeah. <laughs> And she's also a member of the Anthropocene Working Group, which is this, uh, I was on this for six years. It's a group of uh, people sitting, uh, mostly scientists, uh, some others, um, assessing whether the world is now uh, ours, literally, in a scientific way, ours. Uh, we've, uh, we've appropriated the planet, essentially. And uh, I'd love to catch up on how that's going. So uh, we'll start at the far end, I think, uh, with, with Elke. Um, um, Again, to me, the, the title of this was um, unthinkable, but how, maybe unbelievable is better. Could you talk about beliefs and, versus thought? And, and when, but when you think about how people think or react to this climate change problem or don't, what are the things that come to mind? Is like, you know, why don't they get this? Or wouldn't it be great if? 
I think climate change uh, in many ways is a perfect storm for the kind of issues that I study. I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, so I look at how the human mind, you know, the human brain processes information. Uh, and then also with my colleagues, I look at motivation, what motivates us you know, to, to do things, what motivates what, what motivate us to change, given that most of the time we don't like change. Uh, and uh, I've looked at other issues, whether it's insufficient pension savings, you know, our eating habits, and we, so we, we like to stay healthy, but we also like to have our cake and eat it too. Uh, and I think sort of all of these issues sort of dwarf in, in comparison to climate change because it has all the same recipe. Uh, action requires uh, costs, you know, uh, inconvenience upfront, for sure, now. Uh, and the benefits come down the road, you know, they come in dribbles, uh, they, they, they come with high uncertainty. At least for pension savings and for eating, it's our future selves we're benefiting. Yeah, in the case of climate change, it's future generations, people in faraway places. Uh, so all the things that make it difficult, you know, sort of are in, 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 in force uh, and more collective action issues. And, you know, and, and so to some extent, it's, it's, it's a miracle that we do anything in that space. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me just add one other thing. Is, uh, the, the closest, you know, we, we talked about denial and climate change deniers. I think we all are climate change deniers at some point in time. You know, come Friday afternoon, we don't want to think about that issue. And you know, the closest I can come sort of to, to finding a good analogy to how we react to climate change is how we deal with death. I mean, we all know at some level we're going to die. Uh, it's going to happen, but it's a very cerebral kind of knowledge. You know, it's a statistical fact, and deep down, we don't really believe it's going to happen to us. Uh, and it's also something that's very, very unpleasant to think about. And there, it's a huge problem, and there are no uh, plausible, feasible solutions to that. Yeah? And so it makes sense to just put it out of your mind, switch channels, and think about it when you have to. And I think sort of that we also see in, 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 in the space of climate change. And then the question is, what do we do about it? Yeah, do we have to, if, if there is an information deficit, for most of us, it's no longer that this is a problem we have to deal with. It's what can we do about it, you know, individually uh, and collectively, and can we communicate that there are solutions? Because I think it's the absence of seeing that this is something that's solvable in principle that also causes us to turn away. Uh, aside from all the, you know, sort of the voluntary and, 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 and ill-intentioned, malevolent uh, denials, but I think sort of at some level we all deny this, this, this really important phenomenon. Great. So um, for those who have not read your book, the most recent one, what's, what is that crying, how, how would you encapsulate, encapsulate that crying um, uh, question you uh, explore? Well, <coughs> um, as a writer of fiction, uh, really what interests me is the strange place of climate change within our imagination and the ways in which climate change really resists our imagination and even our ways of thinking about the world. I mean, you know, since I've been in New York, there have been two uh, really uh, important events in the city. Uh, one was 9-11 and one was uh, Hurricane Sandy, you know. And uh, if you think of the ways in which 9-11 is remembered, I mean, and how much it's memorialized, I mean, really, it's ne it's, it never escapes our memory for one minute. And if you think of Hurricane Sandy, I mean, most of us don't even remember the date, uh, you know. Uh, and there's no such thing as any kind of um, a memorial to it. Uh, really, as far as I know, this is the only event that's uh, happening around Hurricane Sandy. And yet, Hurricane Sandy had such a profound and powerful effect upon the city. And if you consider that, you know, New York has a greater concentration of writers, artists, filmmakers, than virtually any place in the world. And yet, can you think of a single novel or film in which Hurricane Sandy figures? I mean, they're completely absent. And as for asking the question of, are there any paintings, or is there any sculpture, or any art in which Hurricane Sandy figures? We can't even ask that, because it sounds absurd. Uh, you know, because we live in a space where art is so completely disjoined from our circumstances. Uh, that uh, it seems almost, uh, you know, if to merely ask that question is to suggest something illustrative, which has become so pejorative in the world of the arts. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's these things that really interest me. What are the ways in which um, uh, climate change as a phenomenon really resists even uh, the, uh, the imagination of 
uh, the arts and literature. So, uh, you know, uh, far, you know, politicians and bureaucrats and so on are one level of, uh, uh, you know, of people who do need to respond to this. But I do feel that, you know, the fact that the climate change and events of this kind figure so little uh, in our imagination uh, really uh, prepares the ground for denial, if you like. How, mu how much of that do you think is about the gatekeepers for the arts, meaning publishers saying, well, there haven't, these books on climate change don't sell because people don't want to think about this, or, or, or uh, a gallery would think, well, that's just activist art, or is that part of this too? I just, I'm just throwing that um, Yes, I think that must be certainly a part of it, mm -hmm. in that, uh, you know, editors and so on, uh, their literary tastes, their uh, artistic inclinations were also, uh, how shall I say, honed and shaped by a time of climat climatic stability. Right. You know, so they too are not able to, res uh, able to respond. So in that sense, it's a, you know, it's a circular thing. I mean, wh yeah. whether it's the chicken or the egg, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's also curious, if you look at it, uh, that, you know, there are several novels about uh, uh, New York or a city like New York drowning in the near future. You know, there are many novels like that. Yeah. Uh, and yet, there's not a single novel about the actual drowning of New York. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, what is this strange disjunction? Well, that's a, that's a good prod. I hope people are, you know, taking it, taking heed of it, because there are these great stories to tell. They're mostly granular. They're granular stories to tell too about what it must have been like for old people in downtown towers with no elevators, uh, all that stuff, or, or the way communities, um, the uh, what were the the um, uh, Wall Street, um, what was it called, the Occupy Wall Street became Occupy Sandy. You know, sort of a creative transformation of an existing architecture for social action to something else. Uh, there, there's, a plenty of, there's plenty of fodder. There's seem. plenty of material. And let me say, this is not just New York. You know, yeah. uh, uh, Mumbai in India has been through two uh, or three such, uh, in, uh, such events in, the, in, the, in these last 10 years. Mumbai, again, has a huge concentration of artists, writers, filmmakers, and so on. Again, mm. uh, not a single uh, a book or novel or film or artwork uh, about these terrible events that have happened. So, you know, it's not a local phenomenon. Yeah. It's, something, it's something much, much wider. There's, there's one, other, uh, one other aspect of this. I'll probably bounce to you in a minute, but we'll go to Naomi next. But it's the um, George Marshall, who wrote that interesting book about he, the, the, the mind and climate. Uh, several years ago, when I was still writing Dot Earth for the Times, he had gone to uh, area outside of Austin, Texas, where they'd had terrible fires, terrible fires, some part of which the climate conditions were likely in in intensified by global warming. But he interviewed a bunch of people who um, had been through that, and he found that essentially the experience of the disaster made people more of who they already are. If you're, if you're a survivalist, you know, libertarian, go it alone, it made you more feel that you needed that. If you're a group hugger, <laughs> Uh, you know, communitarian, it made you feel more the sense of having to help other people. And that, I don't know whether that's part of a, that even when we have a disaster, we're not experiencing the same story. But that's a story, too, to tell as well. Uh, and George Marshall also went uh, to New Jersey, uh, you know, oh, right, after Hurricane right. Sandy. And he found that when he tried to talk to people about climate change, they got extremely upset. They didn't want to hear about it, didn't want to talk about it. So we'll swing to you on that, too. But Naomi, uh, let's talk about that line between confrontation and, and embracing or whatever, in the, it's also the context between adaptation and mitigation. And it, you would think we're grown up enough, at least at some level, human society, to do more than one thing at the same time. But, it, but for a very long time, the idea of needing to adapt, needing to build a city that can uh, thrive with climate change, even as you cut emissions contributing to it, it seems uh, even the left would resist that sometimes. So, so just uh, you know, stepping back, uh, what's your the thing that drives you crazy about this this context of the climate problem? There's so many. Well, um, nothing about this really drives me crazy. You know, when I became a historian after having been a scientist for many years, my husband said, "Well, the great thing about historians when we started hanging out with them, he goes, they can hold two ideas in their head at the same time." <laughs> <laughs> Some even three, you know. So none of this exactly drives me crazy. It's, it's, that's not really what I experienced. I would say right now, the last few weeks, the last couple of months, 
um, especially the fires in California, which are very personal for me because I've lived mm. most of my adult life in California. I, I feel <coughs> a tremendous sense of sadness. And I feel a very profound sense that um, actually this could have been avoided, not easily, but that there, there are solutions to, you know, substantial solutions to at least going a long way to addressing the problem. And one of the reasons we haven't done that is because it's part of climate disinformation to say that there's no solution, to say that we can't change it, there's nothing we can do about it. And so I guess if something makes me angry, it's that. It's the kind of disempowering rhetoric that says, you know, in a way what you said, that it's like death. Well, yeah, I, I mean, on one level I totally agree with you. In some sense it is like death because a very substantial amount of climate change is now locked in. Um, I don't use the word committed. Scientists always say we're committed to climate change. And years ago, my 15-year-old daughter said, Mom, only men think that commitment is a, you know, a good, a bad thing, right? You know? <laughs> so we're locked in. That's a better <laughs> metaphor. Um, so in that sense, you're right. That part of it's unavoidable. But on the other hand, there's a lot that we can do. And so the rhetoric of it you know, being inevitable, unavoidable, is part of denial and disinformation. And since we know that that's been kind of a prong in the disinformation story, you know, one thing that I think is really important is to talk about the solutions, whatever those are, whether you think of them in terms of mitigation or adaptation. Um, and I guess that was one reason why I was happy to come here today, because one of the points of light, one of the good news stories in this otherwise rather sad story is cities for two reasons. One is because the majority of people in the world now live in cities. And that trend will almost certainly increase in the future. If you look at demographic projections, we see a lot of um, evidence that big cities are going to get even bigger. And that's actually a good thing. Some people think that's bad. They think, oh my god, there'll be x million people in Mexico City or whatever it is, or Sao Paulo. But actually, it's a tremendous opportunity. Because cities actually tend to be more energy efficient than suburbs and the country. And because the potential for energy efficiency in concentrated urban areas like New York or Sao Paulo or Mumbai are very, very great. And in fact, they often correlate or at least align with things that make life in those cities better anyway, like a city that's more walkable. They often align with better health, like a city that has less air pollution. So there really is a good news story to be told about what cities can, be, what cities can do, what opportunities there are in cities. And also, it's the case particularly in the United States, but not only in America, um, cities tend to be more progressive. People who live in cities tend to be more willing to try new things, to be more innovative. I mean, this is a gross generalization, but there's evidence to support it. So that means that places like New York, or Boston, or Los, Los Angeles, or Chicago, or San Francisco, or even Austin, and even actually Dallas, which contrary to what a lot of people think, is actually a majority democratic city, but because it's gerrymandered, you wouldn't know that. Um, you know, you have these pockets of people who are, what's the opposite of change averse? Change welcoming, mm -hmm. uh, risk welcoming, creative, innovative, um, and often politically progressive. So I think there are tremendous opportunities in American cities, and I think we're seeing similar patterns in other places around the world. So that's the place that I get happy, because I think there's real opportunities, and some of the things that need to be done could be done you know, reasonably briskly, let's say within 10 to 20 years. Um, Elke, the other thing about cities is, um, well, about resilience in cities that I've learned in reporting on these questions for a long time is that um, not all, we think about infrastructure as hard things, buildings and white roofs or green roofs or uh, storm barriers, but there's this uh, social infrastructure that can play a big role in cities, behavioral infrastructure that can play a big role in cities being resilient. Uh, the Chicago heat wave, I, I always think back to this, the book Eric Kleinenberg did, uh, 1995 uh, analysis of that showed that neighborhoods that had more cohesion, this is before Twitter and social networks, uh, neighborhoods that had strong church groups, they had a, lot of, a lot fewer old people died because everyone said, oh yeah, El Elsa, she's on the floor in that building. They knew that, and that's kind of part of city's resilience. Uh, what, what other parts of resilience can come from within as opposed to just building stuff? So, so one thing uh, that psychologists study is you know, how can we change the environment, you know, not just the physical environment, but the choice environment, in ways that make the outcome of our decisions you know, more beneficial to ourselves and to others. And we call this choice architecture. And one thing to think about is you know, what's different about living in a city than living in a rural community. 
Uh, and I think one thing that's different about living in a city is you're constantly surrounded by other people. And then just the mere presence of other people, and oftentimes people that you care about, you know, just reminds you of the fact that your actions impact others. You know? uh, and this gets to the fact that we have like a whole bunch of motivations you know, sort of you know, stored up. Uh, oftentimes contradictory motivations. Very few of us actually want to destroy planet Earth. Yeah, but we have other <laughs> motivations that get in the way of sort of making sure it, we, we don't destroy planet Earth. And it turns out that it's a motivation that's active uh, at the time of decision that guides your decisions. And so some recipe to actually motivating change and motivating more foresightful uh, thinking and action uh, is to help people to have these motivations that have to do uh, with the future, having to do with uh, cooperation, having to do with you know, sort of caring for the environment, to be more salient in their minds at the time of decision. And I think that's why people in cities look like they're probably more progressive because you know, they're just more reminded of the fact you know, that sort of cooperation actually is a good thing yeah? and, 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 and that not looking out for others actually is, is a bad thing. So I think that's sort of like a, a, a maybe too long answer to your question. No, not at all. <laughs> I, I wrote down the choice, the architecture of choice. Can uh, I add something about the course. question? Because question? I have had a few thoughts on that, and we've talked about this. I think one of the reasons why there hasn't been more creative response to these stories is climate change got framed early on as a science question. You and I have talked about yeah. this too. And, and in some ways that, we understand why that was. It was because it was scientists who first recognized that when you burn fossil fuels, you create greenhouse gases, they accumulate in the atmosphere. Sooner or later, that has to warm the planet. So it was scientists who were the first people who began to talk about this as an, as an issue in the 50s and 60s. And once it gets framed as a scientific question, then the only writers who can write about it are science fiction writers. And actually, some <laughs> have, right? Like Kim Stanley Robinson has made this a major right. theme in his work. But as you know better than I do, uh, editors dismiss that as genre fiction, right? So, and when we wrote our book, The Collapse of Western Civilization, my agent said to me, Do not call this science fiction. And I said, Okay, what should I call it? She goes, Just say you wrote a book. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm happy with that. <laughs> Can you, can you actually give them a thumbnail for, about oh, what it is? So it's, yeah. um, it's I guess you could call it speculative fiction. It's a work of fiction um, in which the narrator, there's really only one character, it's the narrator who is a historian 300 years in the future looking back on, on our present, on us, and saying how is it possible that they knew so much about this problem, had such sophisticated science, and yet failed to act. And then she tells the story of what happened as the consequence of our failure to act. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, and it's a wonderful book, so if you haven't read it, you must. <laughs> you. It's very short. It's wonderful to end short. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't take long for the world to end. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with you, uh, Naomi. I think the, uh, the whole issue of it having been, uh, you know, that scientists were, as it were, the, the di diagnosers of this, uh, of this whole problem has really resulted in it being thought of in a particular way. But as far as I'm concerned, I think it's fundamentally a cultural problem. It's a, it's a, you know, the whole issue of uh, climate change is ultimately driven by culture, and most of all, it's driven by a culture of desires. And that's where I think I would disagree with you about the whole thing about uh, cities, because I think you're describing really uh, first world cities and American cities but, you know, the major drivers of climate change today aren't in the first world. They're really in Asia, uh, you know. Um, and if you look at the way that this plays out within the Asian context, when an Asian peasant abandons his land and moves to a city, he is really becoming acculturated into a culture of desire. So he's, his consumption pattern changes completely, his energy, uh, his emissions patterns change completely. I don't know that there have been any studies about this, but I'm absolutely sure that uh, an Asian, uh, a Chinese or Indian farmer, when they're in uh, their village, emit much, much less than they do once they, once they move to the city. So, uh, you know, I think, in fact, this whole process of uh, urbanization is actually one of the things that's driving uh, climate change uh, in a very significant way, not only because of all the people who are moving to cities and adopting a new form of uh, uh, consumption, but also because, really, you know, we talk about climate change being driven by uh, carbon emissions. But really, the, I think right now the major driver is uh, construction, the construction industry. Anywhere you go in the world, but most of all in Asia, everywhere you look, 
enormous buildings are arising all around us. And cement is really one of the most uh, uh, you know, carbon heavy uh, forms of, uh, uh, of uh, industry. Uh, and what is behind it? Ultimately, it's the real estate industries. And the real estate industries have literally taken over the world. I don't, <laughs> think, it's, I don't think it's any accident that the president of America today is a real estate person. <laughs> I think you're going to see this again and again. Because I can tell you, I, I, I spend half my time uh, in a small village in India. Mm. And I see now, you know, completely pointless projects. As long as there's cement involved, they <laughs> come up overnight. Yeah. You know, this whole spree of dam building, what's behind it? It's the cement industries. You know, and so I agree with you. I think that, I think actually the, in the real world, scientifically speaking, it's, it might be possible to stop this. But in the social world, I don't think there's anybody in the world who can take on the construction industries. Th these are really interesting questions. I, uh, the I'll give you a little sliver of what I've been working on the last few months. I was in, in rural India, east of Mumbai, Mumbai, a few months ago. I'm doing a big story about cooking and pollution and efforts to fix the problem. And everyone there, too, has a different solution, a narrative. The West came in with stoves, presuming that an Indian woman who has to harvest firewood for a couple hours a day would prefer to work with this device that's simplistic and isn't tuned to her, her lifestyle or, or her goals at the moment anyway and and what I hear about one of the things I hear about is uh, and this relates to the is it the real estate industry industry or is it um, they call it suppressed de suppressed demand in other words when people who are uh, having to spend four hours a day just cooking that's just cooking time and then another couple of hours a day getting the fuel to cook or paying precious um, money to them, LPG, fossil fuel, is just a gift. And, uh, and that is the aspirational fuel and anywhere in India, actually in parts of Africa too. Everyone looks to that as the solution. And, and, and in the end, it can have a lower um, carbon footprint than some of these other things. But there, there is this question, of how much of this is internal and our need for energy? How much of it is this, this uh, sort of the merchants of, whether you want to call it merchants of consumption, <laughs> you know, that's... But they go together, right? It, yeah, so how much of it again... Driving consumption works in part is because people do like to consume, but there's also different ways to think about consumption. Yeah. But can I ask... I'm of course, yeah. Follow. Everyone here should feel yeah. free to... So, so what you say is very important and provocative, but it raises this big question. It seems like you're suggesting that we would be better off if many of these rural villagers could stay in rural areas rather than moving to cities. But, I mean, is, is, is that what you're suggesting? And if so, is that a plausible... I, I, I'm suggesting, in the first place, that the movement to cities, that the greater urbanization, and most of this is in Asia, really, yeah. uh, does not by any means uh, represent the hopeful trend that uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're suggesting or gesturing at. <laughs> Uh, for another reason, which is that the city is actually, it's the, once people enter the city, they enter also middle class uh, patterns of thought. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the city, uh, it's the middle classes in India that are incredibly resistant to climate, uh, to, you know, to climate change mitigation. I mean, violently resistant, you might say almost. Yeah. Uh, whereas people who are in the countryside, who are exposed to these, uh, to these realities, uh, understand it much better, you know, what they're facing. So, sh uh, should I say that, uh, you know, more people should remain in the countryside? Uh, today, that's not something anybody can say. Why? Because then I'm saying that poverty is better. But I could say then, also, what is the crisis? I think this is where we've gone so profoundly wrong. Yeah. What is our judgment of what poverty is? You right. know, uh, right. when Aristotle lived, presumably somebody went and fetched firewood for him. Was Aristotle a poor person? I mean, were our grandparents poor because they didn't have washing machines? Uh, but yet now this pattern of desire is in place. And uh, to even consider disrupting it is, yeah. to, uh, is to run up against a sort of uh, agreed global definition of what is wealth and what is poverty. Okay, I wanted to get at the, the time scale issue, which is something that Kim Stanley Robinson's books and others when you smear us out over longer time scales, or like the Manahatta exhibit I was talking about, um, we, we have a really hard time making decisions on those time scales, even when with climate change, those are the decisions. How much do we mitigate now for the sake of climate stability in 2100 or beyond? Uh, and, and I don't know whether you've studied that in the sense of choice architecture, or was there any way to get around that? Uh, Ray 
Pierre Humbert, I interviewed him a couple of years ago in this, and uh, they did a really good paper where they said, uh, let me see if I can encapsulate this. The title of this paper was Multimillennial Multi Consequences for Sea Level and Climate of 21st Century Decisions. <laughs> That's basically a, their paper, and they had this great diagram showing you that sea level for the next 5,000 years is ours to make. So how does that work? Is there any way to fix that? Or does, is it even appropriate to ask that question? Well, I, I, I think it's undeniable that we have a problem with this, not just sort of the general public, but also scientists, of the fact that every, all, our, all our projections end at 2100. I mean, there's nothing magical about 2100, but it's yeah. just a convenient cutoff. Uh, and for most of us, when we think about, you know, sort of, uh, putting weight on future consequences, there's uh, something called the present bias. If I can't have it now, I care about it much, much, much less. Uh, and then we sort of only sort of very little uh, differentiate between things that are a little bit in the future or very much in the future and, and so on. So I think the question is, you know, again, how to focus people on, on the future, given that this is not something we do naturally. And this is probably part of our evolutionary heritage. Yeah? Uh, our problems used to be simpler. It used to be important that you survive till tomorrow. You didn't go to the drinking hall when the lion was there. Because if you don't, devise, don't survive till tomorrow, then you, know, sort of, you don't have to worry about the day after. Uh, we no longer have that kind of uh, latitude. Yeah? We live in a complex society where we have to think more about the future. And so given that we don't do it naturally, we naturally focus our finite attention on ourselves, on, on the here and now. Are there ways you know, that we can sort of use I think legacy motivation is, is one of the things that has been quite successful, you know, sort of getting away from us, but thinking about what we leave behind, or future generations, our own children or other people. Uh, getting people to focus first on the future rather than focusing first on, on the present is one way of doing that. And I think you know, Bloomberg's Risky Business Report you know, did this very nicely. He reframed the issue as one of what, you know, sort of what, what the status quo is in action and anything that, that we change is going to have a cost. He said, well, let's focus on the cost of action, yeah? uh, uh, cost of inaction, and, 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 and compare those two. And so he basically sort of focused on the future with our status quo first and having that, us imagine that. So I think some, some of it has to do with the sequence in which we do things, and we tend to start with the here and now, and then we go into the future. Uh, and I think that's also where, where, where uh, fiction yeah, or the arts can help us. You know, we, ha we have this amazing sort of uh, anchor on, on the here and now, and so change is very incremental oftentimes. Change is not transformative. You know, we, we think about small, small, small wrinkles. Uh, that we can change. Uh, I think uh, Ford at some point said, if he had asked people when he invented the automobile what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in, in hindsight, maybe faster horses wouldn't have been such a bad idea. <laughs> or so or ones that time. don't produce as much manure. Yeah. <laughs> right, that, was, that was the other. And so one challenge we all have is, yeah, how do we sort of get out of us being stuck on, on, on what we have, whether it's our current economy, the carbon economy, uh, whether it's you know, sort of our current way of living, our current conception of happiness, happiness being uh, tied to consumption. Uh, I think once we change our, what, what, what's meant by happiness you know, and make it more communitarian uh, and, and, and getting away from these you know, sort of transaction and, 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 and consumption metrics, uh, I think a lot of other things will follow, but how do we do that? It's not, it's not yeah. so easy. We're going to go to your questions in a few minutes, but I've got a couple more, to, and hopefully everyone here will have one or two to ask each other as well. Um, you talk about this sort of status quo bias, which is clearly there, uh, the bias toward the present. One thing I've wondered about off and on is, um, like with this movie, Geostorm, or whatever it is, which I haven't seen yet, or um, Day After Tomorrow, we, we also seem to have a catastrophe bias, at least in our imagination. We're, we're attracted way more to cast catastrophic futures, dystopian, than to stories that work out. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, it, they're boring and they're too much like the present. Uh, there's this place outside of uh, Vienna called IASA, I-I-A-S-A, it's a long name. They study complex systems. And I, I spent a week there a couple of years ago and they do these, they've done a lot of modeling of the human adventure, but going forward over the next three or four centuries. And they, they put in scenarios, they have, you know, fertility rates, population, I'm sure someone will ask about that population issue. Um, and they have scenarios that get us to kind of this quiet planet in 2300. Th this is just a scenario. No one knows whether you can actually make, make it happen, where, where there is no catastrophe between now and 2300, and we end up with a population of about one or two billion prosperous people. So that's in the system. It's there, there, you can draw those lines, but, and how does that work? You know, well, it's, it's like a tiny tweak in fertility rates. 
Um, and if, you, if it's the wrong tweak, then you end up with a depopulated planet where you need way too many robots. But, um, so, so I don't know, are, are we missing scenarios? Are we not, and this would include the fiction world, you know. I know Kim Stanley Robinson actually writes books that are sort of non, non-calamitous sometimes. It, uh, but, but is that just not read because it's not as exciting as when the hunter comes back from the hunt, you know, with some scary story to tell? I, I don't know. How does that... Maybe I'm a well, you. I mean, I've always thought part of the problem with climate change is that it, it isn't actually a catastrophe. It's more like the death of a thousand cuts. There are so many little different ways in which this is playing out. And, you know, in the past, it was always the case that deniers and doubters would say, accuse scientists of being alarmist and catastrophists. But the reality is, when you think about it, so many of the things we're facing are just a lot of small things that add up in bad ways, or even if you think about sea level rise, right? I mean, it's really just a very <laughs> tiny amount of sea level rise in any given year. Right. But over time, that adds up in ways that can be very, very consequential. Um, and the other thing that's weird about it, and, and you know, this feeds into your thing about imagination. So, but now we're in a situation. So that's what I used to say ten years ago. That I thought the reason why it was hard to get people's attention for climate change is because it wasn't a single catastrophe. It was a death of a thousand cuts. But now here we are. Fast forward to Harvey. Fast forward to Maria. Fast forward to the Napa and Sonoma fires. And now we are really are seeing catastrophes and crises. And even with that, it seems that. There's a failure of an imagination that doesn't enable us to quite put it all together somehow. So I don't know what to make of that. Um, I think it's interesting <coughs> what Andy said that um, you know we are drawn to this catastrophic uh, idea of a future or something, and actually, it's, you know, climate change is exactly as you said. It's uh, death by a thousand cuts. It's horrible, ugly things. I mean, like in Harvey. You know, uh, what, it, what is that that spills out? It's everything we don't want to think about, like sewerage and drainage and waste and pollution, ugly, horrible things. So, you know, when I, uh, I've been corresponding with friends in Houston, uh, you know, and Houston being Houston, most of these people are very prosperous people. You can see that they just simply cannot imagine that this stuff is coming up for them. This is stuff that third world peasants should be dealing with. Not them. Uh, you know, I mean, they just can't get their minds around it. So at the end of the day, what is it really? I think it's really that, you know, most writers, most of us, most, most of us here are liberals who are, in some sense, and liberals are also progressives, which means that you believe in progress, which means that you believe, as uh, our President Obama loved to say, that the arc of history tends towards something wonderful. Well, I've been wondering about that of late. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we begin to see, actually, there is no arc of history. Uh, history is a labyrinth through which we wander blindly, not knowing yeah. where we enter <laughs> and where we exit. And it's impossible for us to fit that into the narrative, that what we are facing is a long, ugly, steady decline. That's a, that's a challenge a little bit on your assumption that sort of we, we, we love dystopias more than utopias. If you look at the most emailed articles in the New York Times, they are the, you know, the human interest, you know, feel good kind of stories. So I think it's worth sort of putting that to a test but, and but producing more utopias. And not utopias in the sense that they have to be boring, you know, uh, but yeah. utopias in the sense that they show us a way forward. You know. But I think that the other part of that also is, I mean, I'm trying to write a book now, which is the companion volume to the collapse of Western civilization. <laughs> <laughs> After that book came out, I got all this email from people saying, this is great, now please write the book that tells us how it goes the other way, you can do a little ah. companion box set, you know. But here's the thing. It's a much, much harder book to write. It's actually much easier to see how this all goes wrong, much yeah. harder to see how we fix it and make it right. Um, one thing I'd like to add, though, it was interesting that you used the word communitarian, because actually that's, I think, what gets... Because, you know, we do know of two countries which are acting very fast uh, for the future, planning long-term. One is Holland, and the other is China. And as you say in your book, China is the country that's most likely to come out of this well. What is it in common between these two countries? Why is it that they can imagine a collective future while others can't? So I would say that it's actually countries which are sort of, which have very powerful class divisions that actually will find it hardest uh, to deal with this because everybody will say, well, you know, I, in the end, it's not me that's going to be affected. It's, uh, you know, those people out there. So, you know, the whole thing about 
why we do these terrible things to nature, as a French philosopher said, is not because we hate nature, uh, it's because we hate each other. <laughs> Can I just add? I yeah. think the planet will be just fine. We're not here to save the planet. Yeah, we're yeah. here yeah. to save the planet for our continued existence. That's right. Yeah. If you haven't seen George Carlin's epically wonderful 1993 monologue on that point, look for it online. Uh, it, and the punchline is, we, we were put on Earth to, to make plastic. <laughs> but but he but he taught, that was our that's our our role. That's what the planet had in mind for us to make, make plastic. So. Uh